Good morning, church. Good morning to those that are on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Lynn Hawkins. I am a member of New Bernie Rexus Missionary Baptist Church, but I am an intern here at High Park Lutheran Church with um, Pastor Veronica and Pastor Sarah, where I am learning so much and being in such a pleasure of being a uh, servant under this Um Our first we're going to start with Luke, the 23rd chapter, 32nd verse through 34. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothing by throwing dice. The title of my sermon is The Only One. Of the four Gospels, Luke, the physician, is the only one that records these last words. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. As I continue to study this passage, I ask myself two questions. What is the meaning of forgive? And in this passage, what needs to be forgiven? The word forgive appears 109 times in the English Standard Version of the Bible. The Cambridge Dictionary defines forgive as to stop blaming or being mad at someone for something that person has done or not punish them for something they've done. What needs to be forgiven? If we back up to the beginning of chapter 23, verses one through five, the leading priest of the church takes Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. The officials were upset because Jesus was upstaging their teaching. Jesus was setting people free physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually with true deliverance. But he is falsely accused of misleading the people questioned by Pilate of his credentials, and then bounced to a second trial to him. Luke, again, is the only one that records the encounter with Herod. Verse 6 through 12, I love how the reputation of Jesus has preceded him because Herod just happened to be in Jerusalem and is wanting to see Jesus perform a miracle. In my mind, Jesus is not there to put on a show. So Herod questions Jesus Per Luke, but Jesus refuses to answer. Meanwhile, the accusers and political leaders have come together to shout accusations as the soldiers begin to beat, mock, and ridicule Jesus. They put a royal robe on him and take him back to Pilate's court. Pilate and Herod, who were once enemies, have now joined forces because they found something that they have in common, what to do about Jesus. Political Political corruption did not just happen, you all. It's been going on time after time. That's right. Pilate calls the church leaders and leading priests together and informed them that he cannot find any fault with Jesus. There is nothing that warrants the death penalty for this man. But to appease the people, Pilate would punish Jesus and let him go. But why punish him? If Jesus is innocent, why not just let him go? Pilate would not man up and make the decision. The justice and political system did not just get corrupted, you all. There was no place for wishy-washy governmental figures then, and there's no place for them today. The officials wanted to kill Jesus and free Barabbas, who was being held on murder and charges of insurrection. The people wanted to kill the deliverer instead of the one that caused the murder and insurrection against the government. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? Let the real criminals go, but crucify Jesus. A week ago, the crowd was shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Jesus was riding on a hum humbly on a colt. A week ago, they were preparing for the Passover, but now we are preparing for Jesus' death. As the mob shouts, crucify him. Pilate gives into the intimidation of the crowd and sentences Jesus to death. Jesus is now being led to the place called the skull, or 
Calvary, where he is humiliated by carrying his own cross. I wondered how big the cross was, so I researched and found an example. In 1870, French architect Charles Bohalt de Fleur cataloged all the known fragments of the true cross. He determined the cross Jesus was carrying weighed 165 pounds, was 10 to 13 feet in height, and almost seven feet wide. A very heavy load for an innocent man to carry. Verses 25 through 26, on his way to Calvary, Jesus has an encounter with Simon from Serene, which is only, which is a city in Northern Africa. The soldier sees Simon and made him help Jesus carry the cross, which was meant to be a sign of humiliation moment for Simon, but it turned out to be an opportunity that brought him to Jesus. Yeah. Reverend Dr. Gonzalez last week mentioned that Luke is an intentional writer. This mention of a black man helping Jesus carry the cross was in my opinion, shows the resilience, the strength and the courage of the black race to persevere through the burdens and tests and trials then just as we do now. The government officials, church leaders, and crowds now nail Jesus to the cross between the two thieves early on Friday morning. They hang him like a common criminal. Jesus understood that although this must happen, the way this is being handled is sinful and that with wrongness, just as righteousness, there shall be a payment. And God being the only one who can forgive sin, Jesus prays for his offenders, while also fulfilling the prophecy per Isaiah 53rd chapter 11 verse. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will take, will make it possible for many to be counted righteousness for he will bear all their sins. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercessions for his, inter his transgressors. His arms are stretched wide. His hands are spread open with nails. His feet are nailed one over the other. He is wearing a crown of thorns. Every breath taken is excruciating and the pain is indescribable. How do you muscle up the strength to ask for forgiveness for those who have turned their backs on you? Those who have trumped up charges against you while in unbearable pain? Jesus prays for his offenders, the Jewish leaders, Roman politicians, Roman soldiers, and the bystanders. I thought to myself, wow, Jesus, I love that you are the ultimate example because I can honestly say, I am not always there to pray for my enemies. I'm like James Brown, I want a bitch, I want some payback. I want my offenders to suffer. Bonnie Curry on the Abide app says that forgiveness is the heartbeat of God. God loves those that hate him, embraces those that mock him, pursues those that reject him. Jesus expressed compassion for his executioners. There is no limit to his forgiveness. This was a direct expression of grace and mercy on the cross. But Jesus tells us, you have heard what you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? If Jesus had said anything other than Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, that would have contradicted and negated all he had come to fulfill. That would have made him like us. 
Jesus does not have to do anything, or Jesus does not have us do anything he himself would not do. And while I am sometimes wanting concrete and not superficial justice to be shown, it is easy to point a finger at the soldiers and the officials because we see what they did. But the prayer was for all our sins, past, present, and future. So if I move the distractions out of the way, I realize this prayer was for me also. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. God has given my enemies the same opportunity he gave me years ago to repent, believe in their heart, and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. As I close, I wonder sometimes who else could have paid the ransom of sin? All that came before Jesus and after were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Jesus was not only a man, but he was also God's unique son, God's only begotten son. Because Jesus never disobeyed God and never sinned, he was the only one that could bridge the gap between the sinless God and the sinful people. I asked the question, Lord, how did you do it? How did you stand there and take the questions, the ridicule, take the questioning of your character intentions without getting angry and knocking them down? The Lord brought to my attention my sister, Katanji Brown Jackson, and her recent appointment as the first African American female US Supreme Court judge. The Lord told me, when you know your purpose, when you know your reason for being, when you know the plan of the higher, and you know the plan is bigger than them all, you can stand there, poets, students, with the inner strength of God and take whatever they dish out. Who else can do it? You are the only one. Amen. Amen. is Reverend Teresa Jackson. I am a member of the Morgan Missionary Baptist Church, but I am here to represent today Lady Bethesda Missionary Baptist Church. I serve there as an executive assistant as well as part of their ministerial staff, and I am so happy to be here. Amen. I am coming from Luke 23, verse 43. I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, as I read and studied this word, I saw several things. I saw different mentalities. I saw doubt, coat tail, and realistic. And I saw denial and confession. And so my title today is, Your Today Answer is in the Middle. So here we are in the text, and Jesus, after, after and because of all he had done, prior to this day, this time, the healing, saving, forgiving, feeding, raising of the dead, providing, etc., has been sentenced to death. After being lied on, talked about, abused, spit on, whipped, mocked, my Jesus was hanging on the cross between, between two criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Yes, Jesus was in the middle of what I call denial and confession. Today you will be with me in paradise. You see, unbeknownst to anyone, far beyond the understanding of family, friend, or foe, Jesus was rebuilding his divinity as well as his humanity while here on earth. We saw the character of Jesus up to the bitter end. For not only did he display his compassion, his humbleness, his love, his forgiveness, and on and on and on, he also lived and served on earth. He, as he lived and served on earth, 
He also displayed the same character while hanging on the cross. Now, how do I know that? Because even while hanging on the cross, he asked God to forgive those who will crucify him. Also unbeknownst to anyone, Jesus knew that those who were witnessing and taking in what was happening to him at that moment, on that afternoon, he knew that they did not understand. For he knew that all he had to do was say the word and legions of angels. And we're talking 6,000 plus angels because one legion is 6,000. But all he had to do was say the word and legions of angels would have come to rescue him. And life as they knew it and as we know it would be no more. But because of his love toward us and his obedience to his father, he went through the agony and the pain and stayed on that old rugged cross, suffering for you and for me. No, they did not understand who was in the middle. You see, the first criminal who I identify as denier was the criminal who did not want to accept responsibility or receive the punishment for his crime. And like Thomas, he had doubt mentality and wanted proof that Jesus was who he said he was. Even while hanging on the cross right next to Jesus, he did to Jesus what everyone else was doing. He was scoffing at them saying, if you are who you say you are, save yourself. And oh, while you at it, save us too. The coat tail in town. Yes, denial in his sarcastic way wanted to ride the coat tail of the one he did not believe in. You see, even though he doubted, he was holding on to what he heard Jesus could do or was supposed to be. For at that very moment, it did not matter that he did not believe. His goal was to be free from his punishment. Like some of us, his focus was on the physicality of being saved, of being free from the current state that he was in, facing death. Not fully realizing or understanding that Jesus was the one who would and could actually give him eternal freedom. He did not realize or understand that his savior was right there in the middle. The other criminal who I identify as confess confession had a realistic mentality. You see, reality set in somewhere down the line and he realized who was in the middle, which caused him to humble himself and seek forgiveness. He even said to denial in so many words, it's no secret you have doubts in your heart, but here you are about to die and you still don't get it. You still have no fear. He went on to acknowledge that they both deserve to die, but Jesus did not, for he had not committed any sin. Yes, I could hear confession saying, you're so worried about being physically free. What about the spiritual freedom we can both possess? Wow, can you imagine someone, especially someone who is part of your enemy club, taking up for you, making it clear that you should not be punished at all? That does not normally happen. But my Jesus, who did absolutely nothing wrong, who only tried to love, save, feed, heal, etc., was being punished. Oh, yeah. And he suffered and died just for us. Oh, yeah. Realizing that his counterpart, denial, just did not get it. I could imagine confession doing two things, taking a different attitude and taking a different posture. Yes, sometimes when we recognize who's in the middle, our attitude changes. And so I could imagine confession saying, oh, we, let me just worry about myself, my own salvation. And then turning his head to Jesus, that different posture, and saying to Jesus, who was in the middle, Jesus, remember me. 
You see, while hanging on the cross next to Jesus, despite his wrongdoing, this man demonstrated what Paul wrote about in Romans 10 and 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah. Yet somewhere down the line, confessions, hearts, mind, and desires change. And he called on the Lord and got an answer. Oh, yeah. And not just any answer. He got a today with a blessed assurance type of answer. Oh, yeah. Jesus assured him on that day, at that very moment of his eternal home. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. Oh, what joy it is to have the blessed assurance that Jesus is yours. That today, you can and will be saved. Even while hanging on the cross, the songwriter puts it like this. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Now, how many of us can say that we know that we know that we know without a doubt that today we will be with Jesus in paradise? How many of us can realistically say that we have the blessed assurance that Jesus is ours? I'm talking about you. Can you really say for yourself that you are not riding on someone else's coattail, on grandma's faith, on the preacher's word every Sunday morning? But you have your own relationship with Jesus to the point that if and when you call on him, you will get an answer. I'm talking about based on your own faith, on your own belief, and on your own understanding of Jesus. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, when you recognize and understand who you are next to, who's in the middle, when you seek forgiveness, when you understand where your help when you desire to have right relationship with the one who can help you, in this case, Jesus, then you can and will have the assurance of eternal life. For you do know that is why Jesus lived and died. So we can be saved and have eternal life. For John 3, 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then he goes on to say, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Yeah. Church, it was all part of God's plan for your today as to be in the middle. And so as I close, I encourage all of us during our seasons of denial and confession, when we've done wrong, when we don't have it all together, when we are hanging on our own personal crosses, that if only we would confess our sin and accept responsibility for our actions by calling on the name of Jesus, asking for forgiveness, allowing denial and confession to meet in the middle, I believe in in my sanctified spirit that we will get a today answer and be with Jesus in paradise. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast unto the Lord. The humble shall hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt God's name. Just magnify the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord with me on this good Friday and let us exalt God's name together. I am so grateful to be in the house of the Lord today on this Good Friday 2022. And I thank Dr. Reverend and the Greater Bethesda community for this opportunity to be included amongst all of these beautiful women of God. The scripture today comes from John 19, 
verse 26 from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, when Jesus saw that his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. The title of today's sermon is The Gaze of Jesus. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, I thank you for this day. Lord, and we pray that everything that is said and done glorifies you. Now, Lord, hide me behind your cross so that, that you may see, that people may see you and not me. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, for you are my strength and you are surely my redeemer. Amen. By this third word, Jesus had already interceded on behalf of those who orchestrated his state-sanctioned execution. And he had promised a remorseful thief residence with him in paradise. Then Jesus turns his gaze to his mother, who accompanied by the other two Marys and the disciple whom he loved all who were gathered near the foot of the cross. And Jesus says, woman, here is your son. Mary had been with Jesus from the cradle of her womb up to this moment right now. Mary was there when the angel revealed that she would, had found favor that God, that from God that she would conceive a son and that the Holy One to be born would be called the Son of God. Mary was there when the child leaped in her womb and, Mary, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary was there when the shepherds came to celebrate the good news that a savior had been born who is the Messiah, the Lord. Mary was there when Simeon praised God for the Holy Spirit had revealed that salvation would come through Jesus. Mary was there when Jesus stayed behind at the temple because he said he must be about his father's business. And in today's third word, Mary is at the foot of the cross as Jesus gazes down at her. His pain and suffering has been redirected to the suffering of his grieving mother who had been pierced in her, her, her heart. Perhaps during this moment, they both remember the times that they shared together during his youth and during his ministry. Mm. And even in grief, Mary could find comfort knowing that the that the life of her son, Jesus, was all in preparation for this very moment, the fulfillment of salvation that could only be achieved in Jesus through his sacrificial act of love. Jesus then takes care of his final business by entrusting the care of his mother to the beloved disciple. It is in this intimate bond between Jesus and his mother that prompts us to reflect on our own lives, our grief in our wilderness minutes, moments, and how Jesus intercedes on our path, turning his gaze towards us. Gaze is defined as to look intently with interest and for a purpose usually indicating careful observation of details. In other words, when Jesus gazes at us, it is not a cursory look, but one that penetrates the heart and removes him to and moves him to compassion. I don't know about you, but if I had to recount all the times that Jesus had interceded on my behalf. First of all, I couldn't remember them all. And second, it would take us all day. 
God can take the shattered pieces of your broken lives, what others might consider damaged goods, and restore them for his glory. The Gospels are full of accounts of those whose lives were broken and how Jesus restored them that they might be used in the building up of his kingdom. Let's look at Bartimaeus, who was blind, called out to Jesus to heal him. Jesus turned his gaze toward him. And because of Bartimaeus' spiritual sight, Jesus restored his physical sight. A woman with an issue of blood heard about Jesus and knew that if she could only touch his garment, that she would be healed. When Jesus turned his gaze toward her, the bleeding stopped. A Samaritan woman encountered Jesus at Jacob's well. Jesus turned his gaze toward her and the Samaritan woman's physical thirst was transformed to spiritual living water. There was a woman with a spirit who had been crippled for 18 years. She was bent over and unable to stand up straight. Woman, Jesus called out to her saying, woman, you are set free from your ailment. He had laid his hands upon her and immediately she stood up and began praising God. The ministry of Jesus is framed by his love, compassion, empathy for humanity. Jesus has the ability to know the heart, to understand a person's condition, and respond to their unique needs. Lastly, the question I would like for us to ponder is how do we respond to God's gaze? Our response to suffering is based on the condition of our hearts. Simply put, our hearts inform our gaze. How we internalize human condition how we perceive those who have been labeled as outsiders and exploited for personal gain. Those who are waiting at the borders to get in. Those who live under the violence. Those who ask you for change on the corner. Like the disciples, Jesus has called us to follow him, introducing a new way of being. The old has passed away and the new is here. Our response to all forms of suffering throughout the world should be with the gaze of Jesus, filtered filter through the lens of love, compassion, and empathy. Yes. We have been called to remedy all oppressive practices of empire and temple elite. Yes. which are self-serving and do not align with God's mission. Three weeks ago, during Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearings, she was subjected to some of the most racist and mis misogynistic attacks from the ju judici Judiciary Committee. As I watched Judge Brown maintain her composure, it was obvious that her appointment would not be derailed, but that the disgraceful treatment was a political strategy. It was Senator Booker who turned his gaze toward her with compassion, reminding her that her current situation is only temporary. Don't worry, my sister, don't worry, God's got you. Aren't you glad that God sits high and looks low? That God stays upon creation and, and, and saw that we needed a savior? For there was no one who sought God. All had turned away. Instead, the world sought created things instead of seeking the true creator. God responded by sending Jesus, who is the son of God, who was into the suffering with and for humanity, becoming the atoning sacrifice 
for our sin that we might have eternal life. So don't worry, my brothers and sisters. Our current situation is only temporary. God has got us. Amen. 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 I call the First Baptist Church of Chicago my church home, and I'm also the pastor of the Christian Church of Arlington Heights. Here now a fourth word from Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabach for me. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want to begin this afternoon with a thought, if we had only known. Please pray with me. Only when we hear our prayers echoed in the words of Jesus. Answer us as we worship with the gifts of you. Amen. Amen. If we had only known, if we had only known, what would we have done different? If I had known, and this is as honest as I can be with you all, if I had known, I would have made sure, I would have worked hard to be sure that I was married and living in a really big house well before March of 2020. Yeah. If I had known, I would have at least rented a bigger apartment to make room for roommates, and I would have found some who liked to bake when they were stressed out, who had a Costco membership and collected years of work, and had advanced degrees in disease prevention. That's right. If I had known, I would have done pretty much anything I could to avoid sheltering in place alone in a tiny apartment while trying to pastor a church through a global pandemic during what turned out to be, for so many reasons, the hardest two years of my life. Yeah. Yeah. If I had only known. My friend, Laura, who was married and living with her family, including a small child, during the pandemic, she tells me that it wasn't much better for her. <laughs> she says that being stuck in a small-ish apartment with a small child who constantly needs your attention isn't really that much better than being stuck in an apartment alone. She says it was hard for all of us, just hard in different ways. It wasn't the difficulty itself. It was being stuck there that was the problem. And we were stuck in that moment when it arrived. There was no chance of going back to the time before when we could have done things differently, stocked up on hand sanitizer at least, and we could have gotten ourselves a little bit more prepared. There was no chance of hurrying things along to get back to the normal that we knew. Do you guys, do you remember when we thought it would only be a few weeks? Maybe a month or two? It was as though time stopped for a moment. Weddings and funerals were delayed, celebrations were put off, college entrances were deferred, future plans remain in some ambiguous later time, some vague, whenever this is all over. It was in that moment nearly impossible to predict what the future nearly impossible to gain any forward momentum, nearly impossible even to know which direction our momentum should take us. Yet, in that very moment, 
The moment when the future became so uncertain, we were forced into a painful recognition of our past. The choices we'd made for better or for worse that had led us here to whatever sort of difficult we were living in and could now no longer see a way to escape. Now, hear me right. I don't mean to be blaming any of us or faulting any of us or even saying that we brought our difficulty upon ourselves. Though maybe some of us did. I only mean to say that I am certain that I was not the only person thinking and still thinking if I had only known. We were frozen in circumstances that we never saw coming and yet were somehow also exactly where we had been all along. Mm. We were forced to confront the hardest, most painful parts of whatever situation we had created for ourselves with merely no capacity to see how we might escape or what the future might bring. As individuals and as a society, when the pandemic hit, all eyes were on a single set of statistics and watching that, we were forced to confront the consequences of our choices, to leave so many locked up in prisons, to rely on temporary shelters and volunteers to care for those who were without housing, to leave so many in such precarious financial situations, and of course, to allow the white supremacy that has always shaped our country to fester for far too long. That's right. Amen. We could see it, what we'd gotten ourselves into. We could see the holes in the fabric of our society, the gaps in our community and in our lives, the places absent of any testimony to the God who values every human life. Mm. We could see the holes in our own individual lives, too, as our fear dripped through every crack in our defenses and our pain pooled in every hole in our heart. Mm. We saw the impact of our isolation. We felt the sharp edges of our relationships. We struggled against the anger and the fear and maybe even the hate in our hearts. To face difficulty is one thing. To face difficulty without any sense of a future, without any vision of a way out, to feel the constraints of our circumstance, not just on our bodies, but on our souls. That is a human hell. Mm. And it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder what it was that Jesus must have seen from the cross that day so long ago. Oh. As the Gospels tell it, Jesus had been moving since he was an infant and his parents were warned in a dream to flee from the wrath of Herod. By the time he was a teenager, Jesus knew his place in the world. He knew exactly what he was about. He knew where he was supposed to go. And then every story we've got about Jesus as an adult, he's doing the same going about his father's business, always with another broken person who needed to be healed, another sinner in need of forgiveness, another crowd that needed to be fed. And even when Jesus did have a little bit of time to slow down, tried to take a nap on the boat, have a rest by the well, it always turned into another teaching opportunity. There was always someone who needed him to speak the truth to show them the way to God. Until this moment, the one we hear about in the 34th verse of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, a moment, perhaps the first moment of his life, when there was nothing left to do. Even from the cross, Jesus had been busy. We heard already. He's forgiven the thieves beside him. He's promised paradise. He's taken care of the needs of his mother. And now there's nothing else, nowhere else to go. Mm. I can't help but wonder if Jesus too saw things a little bit differently in that moment, nailed as he was to a cross, unable to see the future in this world, 
but painfully, painfully aware of the cost of every choice that had led him here. He was, after all, living the worst of what humankind could do. Yeah. Every sin sinful part of us, every possible way that the human heart can go wrong, every blind error and every desperate cruelty was on display in this moment. Yeah. In this moment, there was nowhere left to look, nothing else to see, nothing but a broken, hardened, hateful people. And I can only imagine the way that Jesus' own pain must have pulled in our inhumanity. There was no love in this cruel act. There was no justice to this moment. And there was no voice of God giving him the next step on this journey, pointing him into tomorrow, assuring him that he would make it through this day. Because he wouldn't. Mm. That God, the God he had known before, that God could not meet Jesus in this place, in this moment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whatever else we want to say about it, whatever theological arguments we want to engage, it seems to me that these words get at something that is true of the way that all of us fully human folk experience God. Mm. That's this. There comes a moment in our lives when we can no longer know God in the ways that we can have known God. There comes a moment in our lives when we can look back and we can see God who has led us here, but we cannot see that God leading us into the future. Yeah. Often in those moments, we can't see the future at all. Yeah. The God of whom we have always been certain slips away. Mm -hmm. And we must search our doubt for a God who is shrouded in mystery. The God who has always guided our hands and moved our feet vanishes in the face of illness or old age. Mm. And we must learn to look for God's movement beyond what we ourselves can do. Yeah. Yeah. The God who has always spoken powerfully in our hearts falls silent. Mm. And we must seek the sacred in the quietest of things. Mm. The rising of the sun the breath that moves in and out of our bodies, oh, yeah. the look in our loved one's eyes, oh, yeah. the God who has always sparked passion in our hearts fades to memory as depression sets in. And we must search out the God whose presence we can touch with our minds, even when our hearts have gone numb, oh, yeah. whose presence is known only in the simple choice to live one more day. Yeah. The God who has always led us through time can take us no further as we reach the end of our lives. And so we, like Jesus so long ago, must turn to the God of eternity. Mm. Or it is, I think, only the God of eternity who could pull off such a thing. It is only the God who cannot be trapped in time who could hide the door to the future in the very moments when it seems as though our future is lost. Yeah. It is only the God who cannot be bound by any choices that we have made, whose love could have such power at the moment of our cruelest inhumanity. It is only the God. It is only the God who cannot be nailed to any cross, who could be so close, so utterly present in the moment when we feel absolutely abandoned, who could do the most important work of our lives right when we feel the most forsaken. Mm. Amen. Amen.
Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. I am Minister Denise Smith. I am a member of Third Baptist Church of Chicago, but I have been invited to stand before you today as a representative of Third of Greater Bethesda Missionary Baptist Church and Pastor David Watkins the Third. My brothers and sisters, please join me in reading John chapter 19, verses 28 through 29. I will be reading from the New Living Translation as it reads. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this time and opportunity that we can come together to celebrate, Father God, the sacrifice that you have given for us. We thank you, God, and ask that you are invited. We ask that you are invited into this space, dear God, and be with us on today. I ask you, dear God, as I feel like a babe in Christ, learning to walk and to talk, that you allow the Holy Spirit to fill me up and grow in me, Father God. Because I know I am not the only one in this room that may feel that way, God. I ask that you do the same for each and every person present in this space. To God, let your word fall upon each and every one of us and let it return to you full circle through the hearing and the actions in us. Lord, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we consider the fifth word from the cross, for this moment I have before you, I want to speak on the topic of self-care isn't selfish. Amen. Right. We read the words on Thursday spoken from the mouth of Jesus Christ. We know from the text that his words were stated to fulfill scripture. What scripture did Jesus fulfill by making this statement? Most scholars think it is from Psalm 69 and 21. For my thirst gave me vinegar to drink. For, for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. When he said he was thirsty and was offered vinegar, Jesus was pointing, pointing us back to this verse from Psalms 69. It is as if Jesus was saying, what I'm doing now was written about me thousands of years ago. I am a part of God's promise and God's plan that was set in place that has now come to pass. It's good news when Jesus cries out, I am thirsty, because all that God has promised, planned, and set in place will come to pass. God's word is true and it will come to pass. It is also good news when Jesus cries out, I am thirsty, because Jesus displays his humanity. Many scholars believe Jesus' thirst was to show he was fully human. In his humanness, he turned water into wine. He walked on water. He calmed the stormy waters. He healed the sick and made the blind see. It was this man, Jesus, that accomplished divine things. My brothers and sisters, it is good news that Jesus cries out, I am thirsty, because fulfilling scripture and being fully human is exactly what we have been called to do as disciples of Christ. In life, Jesus models for us that we too can fulfill scripture, be fully human and accomplish divine things as the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. And on the cross, Jesus also modeled for us what it means to be fully human. Jesus, the one who is living water, is now thirsty. He could not quench his own thirst, 
When Jesus looked down into the crowd of people, he saw sins of oppression, injustice, and equality. He saw murderers, liars, and thieves. He saw people who were hungry, homeless, sick, and ignorant. From the time Jesus was captured until his death, he endured beatings and now hung from a cross nearing his death. In this crowd, he saw the very things he came to abolish. Jesus was overwhelmed in the midst of completing this mission and fulfilling scripture. The savior of the world was vulnerable and transparent enough to cry out for help. My brother and sisters, let us remember why Jesus came to earth. He came to offer repentance. He came to be a living sacrifice for sins. He came to give us everlasting life. Thank God Jesus came to do all of these things. And I also believe that if we understand our relationship with God, we would know that Jesus models for us that when we are overwhelmed with all that is happening in our lives and in the world, it is okay to ask for help. Yeah. It's okay to cry out for help. It's human and divine to cry out for help and seek care for yourself. Mm-hmm. These past two years during COVID-19 and social unrest have been overwhelming. Being disconnected has been overwhelming. Experiencing death has been overwhelming. Yet, many of us have just kept working, kept moving, and kept serving while ignoring our bodily needs. Mm. And keep our struggles to, and we keep our struggles to ourselves. But Jesus cried out for help. Many people misunderstand the being vulnerable as weakness and misunderstand self-care as a meaning of being selfish. Nothing can be further from the truth. Jesus did not overlook his thirst. Jesus did not overlook his need. In crying out, I am thirsty, an unselfish Jesus practiced self-care and taught us that when you take when you take when you take care of yourself you're also in the best position to take care of your family your friends and your community self care is not just making time to recharge your batteries with the with the nap meditation or by taking a break from your family although all those things count self care is not just about setting priorities setting boundaries and fulfilling mission and purpose. Although all these things count, self-care also includes paying attention to your body, acknowledging your needs, your thirst, and being vulnerable enough to seek care when you're overwhelmed. If Jesus, the savior of the world, could seek help, so can we. Jesus lived and Jesus died as the example as to who we should be in this world. Jesus provided for us while someone else provided for him. And God cared for all of us. It's a full circle of self-care because self-care isn't being selfish. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I pray that this word from God has been a blessing to all of you and that God be a blessing to us all. Amen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Minister Elizabeth Pence. I am so surprised that someone's letting me call myself minister. Uh, (laughs) I am the Ord and social media and tech manager here at High Park Union Church. I am also a student at Chicago Theological Seminary where I'm getting my master's of divinity. I am also a queer non-binary femme. Amen. We also also preach the gospel too. Amen. That's right. So you'll come with me uh, to where Minister Denise left off in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 30. 
when he said, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Mm. Come with me. Mm. He could not even find the strength to pucker his lips at the soldier's sour wine. God is too busy drowning in midair. Outside the walls of Jerusalem on a hill called Golgotha, Christ is beaten, tortured, abandoned, left for dead by his friends. Though his lungs fill with water, he thirsts. The cheap wine they raise to his lips is neither an act of mockery nor to numb the pain of the crucifixion, but is one last act of mercy for mercy. It is the soldier's wine kept beside them to slake their thirst. And as the scene unfolds in my mind and the soldier, as he lowers the hyssop from Jesus' lips, he gets to look Christ in the eyes. He is a soldier following orders, no doubt. But I wonder how many of these soldiers gathered at the crucifixion dreamed of something like this as little boys, that they'd be the good guys, stamping out nameless and faceless deviants in the name of empire. Though they extend one last mercy to Jesus, I wonder who taught them to hate Jesus and people like Jesus. People on the margins of society, and I wonder how long he waited for something like this, if he waited for something like this. And I wonder if he regretted it when he finally got to put a face to the object of his hatred. Yep. When Christ, wine on his tongue, declares it is finished, he is declaring the end of his life and his ministry, a life on the margins, creating a new kinship under a new kingdom and a radical ministry, an inclusive ministry, yes. a love unconventionally and love unconditionally kind of ministry, and in other words, a queer ministry. Mm -hmm. Robert E. Goss writes in the Queer Bible Commentary on John that on the cross, Jesus manifests God's coming out as lover and compassionate sufferer for the world. Hatred, fundamentalism, homophobia, misogyny, racism, and all such place Jesus on the cross. And the final moment in Jesus' ministry is an act of solidarity with those who have suffered in a world that is exclusive and condemnatory. This is important. In John's account of the crucifixion, Christ goes to death with some degree of agency and acceptance. Christ, though dying, is not a victim. In dying, Christ is a victor, proclaiming the end of death-feeling systems of hatred. Yes. But 2,000 years or so later, he can only find the strength to weep as the tear streaks wash the blood from his face. Mm. Outside of Laramie, Wyoming in 1998, Matthew Shepard was beaten, tortured, and left for dead. Matthew yeah, Shepard, a young gay man, was killed by two other young men in a hate crime. His murder elicited the expansion of hate crime legislature to include sexual orientation and gender identity, but the extra judicial killings of queer and trans people continue today. They do. And it is not solely experienced by white cis queer men. Seven seven black trans women have been killed in the United States, including two here in Chicago, right. Elise Mallory and Tatiana Tutu Labelle. In this year alone, it's only April. In fact, the life expectancy of black trans women is between 30 and 35 years old, roughly the same age as our savior when he died. When that is the reality of black trans women in our nation, when legislature is put on the table to deny trans youth and adults the care that they need to live into who God has called them to be. Right. When we are even allowed to say gay. Mm. We need to be firm in saying that the hatred of queer and trans folks is not of God. In fact, it's this hatred that Jesus lived and died to. Right. He says it is finished. He has declared that the example and that the standard for love has been set and no longer can we avoid one another's gaze. We have to look across the ways that we have been taught to hate one another and into each other's eyes. Yes. We can no longer even just pretend that there is an object to our hatred. These are people that we are taught to hate. Yes. Like the soldier raising the kiss up to Jesus's lips must have been taught to hate. See, Good Friday is a call to come to the cross and repent of the ways that we have been complicit in death dealing systems of hatred. Yes against our image-bearing siblings, yes. 
against our queer and trans siblings, against people like Elise Mallory, like Tatiana LaBelle, like Matthew Shepard, against people like me. God have mercy. You can't look them in the eyes today. You can't, but you can look me in the eyes. That's right. And do you see me? Do you see us? What will you do now that you're looking us face to face? Good Friday is not just to repent of the sin, as French mystic Simone Bay would say, of turning your gaze away, but an opportunity to turn towards one another in love and kinship and hospitality as Jesus taught, even while staring death in the face. Yeah. That is the movement that Jesus makes on the cross to go to death with dignity and agency and to die in decisive solidarity with us for no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. From the AIDS crisis to extrajudicial killings to the denial of our human rights, queer and trans people know this movement. We yes. know what it means to stare death in the face. We know what it means to follow sacrificial love all the way to the end. It's in our lineage. It's part of our ancestry as queers. By the way, Elise Mallory is an ancestor. Tatiana is an ancestor. Matthew Shepard is an ancestor. You might also call them the great cloud of witnesses. That's right. I'll close with a story of my personal favorite ancestor, a man named Joseph. His ashes are interred in the backyard of the place where I currently live. He was once a resident there too, in the community living situation with his buddy from the AIDS Pastoral Care Network. Paul, who was a divinity school doctoral student at the university, like your friend and mine, Foster Pinckney, in 1987, was Joseph's buddy, and this word took on a whole new meaning in light of the AIDS crisis. Paul was accompanying Joseph to the end. Mm. And in those days, there was no cure, nor was there any significant acknowledgement or action taken by the state to help the queer and trans community who were dying of AIDS. They were abandoned and left for dead by the United States government. Queer people were staring death in the face. Yeah. However, there were good people who resisted the indoctrination, who turned their gaze towards us in compassion. And pastors in Chicago were some of those people. So while Joseph tended the gardens with Paul and entertained the other residents with his stories, while Paul PhD, uh, there's this framed essay by Reverend Sam Portero next to the window in the sunroom in the place where I live, out of which you can see the golden round doll that marks Joseph's resting place. And the essay reads like this. Joseph drew us together in our love and care for him. And his unfeeling humor and gentle sweetness were a sermon on grace. In the summer of 1988, Joseph's body grew weaker, no longer able to, no longer able to resist even with medical assistance. On August 19, 1988, Joseph died. Again, his ashes are interred in the gardens that he tended, that I know tend, and marked by a golden round bowl that I repainted last summer. Jesus says, it is finished. It is, and it isn't. Joseph was the victim of a death-dealing system of hatred, the one that Jesus lived and died to teach us to dismantle. We should live in a world in which these queer ancestors who lives whose lives were cut off are alive and thriving, they should still be here today. Yeah. These death-dealing systems of hatred have to end. But Good Friday is a reminder that death, though a fact of our world as it is, is not the end. The declaration, it is finished, is an invitation as well for us to declare that in our own lives. We say it is finished because we know how to end it. We have been taught the most excellent way. We have to say no longer to systems that sacrifice queer and trans people on altars to idols of cis heteronormativity. We have to confront one another's gaze when we ask to really see each other. Yes. Do you see each other? You have to. It's the promise that's present in the death of Christ that no matter what death feeling systems might, what they might bring, you resist by seeing over them and into one another's eyes because it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Amen. Amen. To my pastor, Reverend Dr. Jesse Brown of the First Baptist Church, to my brother and sister here, 
Reverend Veronica Johnson and Reverend David Watkins, and to my beloved husband of 36 years, Reverend Dr. David Daniels, to all of you who have gathered here today for this seven last word service, I greet you now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask that you bear with me for just a few moments as I share with you from that seven word from the prophet. Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. I'd like to share with you this afternoon for a few moments from the thought, all in God's hands, all in God's hands. I stand behind this pulpit today to proclaim that is the last word. Jesus has the last word to say from the cross. Jesus has a seventh word. It is a word filled with conviction and assurance. It is a word filled with confidence and hope. It is a powerful word spoken in sincerity and truth. It is a word for heaven to hear and earth to overhear. It is a word blasted from the agony of the cross, all in God's hand. While we wait to hear Jesus speak these last words from the cross, we also wait to hear God speak God's first word to Jesus nailed to the cross. While we wait to hear Jesus speak these last words from the cross, we also wait to hear God speak a word to Jesus nailed to the cross. In the deadening silence of the moment, we wait and wonder, does God see what's going on? In the deadening silence of the moment, we wait and wonder, does God care about what's going on? In the deadening silence of the moment, we wait and wonder, is God going to denounce what's going on? Is God going to stop what's going on? All in God's hands. Well, the silence in which we live today scares many of us. We want God to break the silence. We want God to take sides. We want God publicly to join us as we seek to do good. Join us as we work for peace. Join us as we work for justice. Join us in the work of reconciliation. The silence in which we live today scares many of us. We anxiously wait for God to break the silence. We wait for God to take sides. We wait for God to publicly join us as we seek to do what is right. Join us as we fight to end poverty. Join us as we fight to end mass incarceration. Join us as we fight for climate change. All in God's hands. Well, while we wait to hear Jesus speak words from the cross, we also wait to hear God speak. We are aching to hear God speak. We are aching to hear God speak words born of a parent's love. We are aching to see God act, act with action, forged out of a parent's love. Amidst this moment of Jesus uttering his seventh words, his last word from the cross, can we hear God speaking? Can we hear God speak loudly through actions? Well, my brothers and sisters, recall 
Luke 4. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining. Can you see God speak in stopping the sun from shining? Can you see God speak in blocking the sun from shining? God can stop the sun shining. God can block the sun shining. By blocking the sun, God spoke with action rather than with words. By blocking the sun, God spoke loudly with actions rather than syllables of words. By blocking the sun, God broadcast that God knows what's going on. By blocking the sun, God broadcast that God cares about what's going on. By blocking the sun, God broadcast God the creation of what's going on. God's hand that creates and provides locks the sun. God's hand that died and protects locks the sun. God's hand that serves and delivers locks the sun. God's hand that blesses locks the sun. <laughs> By blocking the sun, God joins in solidarity with Jesus. God joins hands with Jesus, all in God's hands. In the bleakness of a day without any sunshine, Jesus cries out, cries out in pain and agony, cries out in hurt and heartache. He cries out, cries out in faith to God, whose hands hold all power, calls out, cries out in faith to Almighty God. Jesus cries out in his last grasp of life. Jesus finds the strength to shout, and not just with you. Just think of that. Out there in the heat of the day, all of that crowd, Jesus doesn't whisper. He finds the strength to shout, to not just some. With the confidence of knowing that he has done all that God has commissioned him to do all that God placed in his hand. Jesus shout out in a silent loud voice, Father! He calls out to God with a confident trust that God hears him. Father! He calls out to God with the blessed assurance that God sees him. Father! Jesus. Jesus calls out to God, who was with him before time, with him at the beginning of his time, and with him all throughout his time of ministry. And with him now at the end of his time on the cross, Jesus calls out to God. Jesus calls on the God who feels the aches in his broken body, the God who touches the break of his broken bones. In his last grasp of life, Jesus finds the spirit to shout out, Father, into thy hand, I commit my spirit. He commits his spirit. He commits his soul. He commits his life all into God's hand. All in God's hands, all in God's hands. Jesus commits himself, all in God's hands. Jesus commits his past, present, and future, all in God's hands. Jesus commits his legacy and his destiny, all in God's hands. Jesus gives all of his being, all that he is, all that he has, all in God's hands. Jesus places the salvation of the world, all in God. Let us follow Jesus. Let us commit our lives into God's hand. Let us trust ourselves, our lives, our futures, and our destinies all into God's hands. After we've done all that we can, let's turn our world over into God's hands. Trust us. Cast ourselves into God's hands because that God cares for us. We lie in utter dependence on God. When we've done all we can do, still trust.
trust God when we analyze difficult situations and trust our lives to the all-powerful God. As the songwriter said and wrote, all in his hand. All in his hand. All in his hand. I put it all in his hand. All of my burdens, problems. If I have a question, I put it all. Yes, I put it all in his hand. Whatever the problem, I put it all in his hand. I know he can solve them. I put it all in his hand. I put it all in his hand. He can handle it. It's a fact. I put it all in his hand. No matter how great or small, he's the master of the world. I put it all. Yes, I put it all. I put it all in the hand. Yes. Yes. The songwriter is right. God will see us. God will bring us through. God will bring us out. All in God's hands. I put it all in God's hands. All in God's hands. Let and trust, my brothers and sisters, our lives in the world. Father, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. 